Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to Life Well Lived by Amabila Stephen. It's an engaging and enlightening talk show on life, relationships, and the business of life. Grab a cup of juice and just chill. Life Well Lived by Amabila Stephen. Live life. Live. Now, personal development is about being a true, embracing the true version of ourselves. It is all, it's the only meaning to life when we embrace personal development and self-improvement. My name is Amobola Steven. I'm the also fly wheel lead by Amobola Steven. On the show, we focus on personal development and self-improvement topics, occasioning expert and professionals who are high depth in these topics. Now, uh, we realize the importance of embracing personal development and self-improvement along the course of our lives. In that, when we embrace uh, personal development and self-improvement, we get to find ourselves along the way, along the path and in finding ourselves, we realize there's so much innate potentials and possibilities that life has in store for us. Now, personal development and self-improvement um, benefits doesn't happen overnight. You have to constantly improve on yourself in order for you to see your life move from where it is to where it ought to be. This is the mission and the focus of Life Well Lead by Mobile TV. We like to share disruptive yet constructive mindship conversations that is going to transform your life indeed. Today, I will be talking about how we can build an innovation culture. And I have Nick Jane, who is the CEO of Idealscale and also the leading expert on how to make innovation happen. Welcome to the show, Nick Jane. Thank you so much for having me, Amabala, and for the wonderful introduction. Thank you for joining me on the show. Uh, looking forward to a great time indeed. So uh, the first question uh, I would like to ask indeed is, uh, how really can we build an innovation culture? Sure. So firstly, let's start with the idea of why innovation is important, and then I'll uh, try and share how uh, we can build an innovation culture. Innovation is important because if you're not innovating, you're basically dying. And that's true both on the individual level as well as for your company, whether it be a, a small business or a giant corporation. Um, I th there's three things you need to achieve innovation uh, in a sustainable way. Number one, you need the right people. Number two, you need the right incentives and processes. And number three, you need the right tools and technology. And I call the, uh, you can think of this almost like a runner right? or like somebody who wants to get in shape. Some First, you need somebody who wants to get in the right shape like get in shape. Number two, you want you want to make sure they have the right incentives. If you if you tell yourself you're only going to have a chocolate bar after you go to the gym, you're much more likely to go to the gym. And number three, if you're trying to get in shape, it's a lot easier if you have access to a gym and sneakers rather than if you're running barefoot. The same is true with innovation. You need people who want to innovate and be creative. Number two, you need to give them incentives so that they're actually doing something cool rather and rather than penalizing them for doing something cool and new. And number three, you need to give them the tools, resources, and technology so it's a lot easier for them to go do cool stuff. Someone is not going to be creative if they don't have the time, money, resources, technology to go be creative. Oh, okay, really. Uh, but uh, the question is, how do or why do large uh, organizations, why do they struggle with innovation? Sure. If you think about it, by the time uh, an organization become large. This could be a big government entity or a nonprofit or a corporation. When you're large, you've already made it. You're successful. You don't need to do it anymore, right? You've already, you're already, you have billions of dollars. Um, the hunger kind of goes out when you are working for, when you're at a large organization because you've already succeeded. Whereas a small business or a small organization, they're on, they're more unstable. They need to be out there grinding every day in order to succeed. So that's number one, that large organizations often, they don't, they've don't they lost the hunger or ambition that they had when they were smaller and less successful. Number two is when you become large, you become very good at doing what you're already doing. You have standardized processes, standardized operating procedures. You have an entire hierarchy and process. But whenever you have a process to do one thing well, that necessarily inhibits you from doing other things that are a little bit more innovative or creative. And so large organizations basically have to break these two habits. Number one, they need to get that hunger back. And number two, they need to um, uh, kind of find ways to be creative without violating the internal processes and procedures they have to do whatever they're doing well. Uh, but really, uh, MNCs are talking about uh, multinational corporations. Or oh, let's talk about Apple. Now, they are still innovating. And also Samsung. Uh, other uh, MNCs are still doing so. Uh, what's your take on that? 
Sure. So look, there's ex that that's a good example of like companies that have figured out how to be big and be innovative. Okay. But at the same time, let's use let's you said Apple as an example. When Apple came out with the the um, the iPod or the iPhone, those were dramatic uh, innovations and devices, right? Are the new i is the iPhone whatever fifteen or whatever they're on now that much is it that much of a groundbreaker? Or is it just a slightly better phone, slightly better audio codec, slightly better camera? I would say that the innovation has in fact stalled. Apple has not come out with a groundbreaking product in a decade now, right? Uh, all their core products, the the iPad, the the um, the MacBook Air and the iPhone are incremental innovations now. There's not been a groundbreaking innovation yet. And that's why, for example, when ChatGPT, when ChatGPT came out with um, uh, the, the uh, uh, sorry, when OpenAI came out with ChatGPT, Apple wasn't able to build its own AI. They actually have to go to Microsoft or OpenAI to use their uh, their um, AI tools now because Alexa had never got smart enough. So I would say that even large organizations like Apple and Samsung that are you know huge are struggling to remain innovative because at some point you become so large that it's hard to continue innovating. It's possible, but very difficult. Uh, really now still struggling uh, to um, innovate, talking about the uh, big organizations. But let's talk about the smaller organizations. How can they encourage innovation? Sure. So number one, it's it's e it's just easier for a small organization to innovate. If you're 20 people sitting in a room and you can talk to each other, it's a lot easier to innovate. Um, so le actually, let me back up. Small innovations, uh, sorry, small organizations innovate better because communication is more fluid and natural. The, the CEO sits 10 feet away from the janitor, from the, you know, the product designer, from the, the sales rep. So it's a lot easier, number one. But innovation still needs to be a conscious effort. So when you're a small organization, the good news is it's a lot easier for you to do stuff. There's a lot less bureaucracy. The bad news is you often are so focused on doing your day-to-day -day activities that you don't have as much time or thoughtfulness to come out with new stuff. So what I would encourage small organizations to do, or the leaders of small organizations, is to do two things. Number one, Make sure everyone has a little bit of time to think about what's next or what can we do differently, whether that be an hour a week or an hour a month. Um, set aside time to do this. Google used to do this when they were a smaller organization. They had what they call 20% time. Everyone got one day off a week to go work on cool projects. And that's how some of the great innovations like Google Maps came out. Small organizations can do that. Set aside an hour. It doesn't have to be a lot, an hour a week, an hour a month. Um, number two is, uh, provide people with the tools that they need to go in and innovate. There's a, the great thing is there's a lot of uh, free tools out there, both software as well as hardware, that people are giving away for very cheap or very free that will allow people to be more creative. And that can be as simple as paper and post-it notes or very complex design technology that in some cases is available totally for free for small organizations. Uh, now, Nick. Let's face it, uh, face it really squarely. Um, we're trying to innovate organizations, they often face challenges, right? So can we talk a bit about them and how they can overcome these challenges? Sure, so there's lots of challenges folks uh, uh, face when they innovate. The two biggest ones that I see constantly, and, and this is again, the business that IdeaScale is in, is number one, the wrong incentives to innovate, and number two, the, the la a lack of resources to innovate. So let's break those two down into separate things. The wrong incentive, so when you become a, well, well, this can be true for small or large organizations, they often, uh, uh, they structure incentives where you, uh, are discouraged from innovating rather than encouraged. And the reason they do this is because, uh, or the reason that it unfortunately happens is because innovation requires experimentation. It requires trying new things. And when you try new things, you're going to fail, right? The very first time you try and ride a bike, you fall over. And a lot of organizations, they penalize you every time you fail. When you tried something new and it failed, you get fired or you get demoted or you get laughed at. And when you succeed, the company takes your idea and makes a billion dollars off of it. Um, so you as an individual, you're not incentivized to, uh, to innovate in most organizations. In fact, if you want to innovate, you go join a startup or you go start your own company and you take your innovation and great ideas with you. So the, the solution to that is actually create incentives for people to, uh, to innovate, encourage people to try out new things and don't like, 
uh, penalize them when they fail. And that's actually a really easy solve, but it does require a cultural change in how organizations think about reward systems. The second is tools and technology. The, the funny thing is a lot of companies uh, and organizations do want their people to be innovative, but they basically hire a bunch of people and say, go be creative. And they don't provide these teams or individuals with resources. And re they just literally hire people and say, go sit in a room and go be creative. Um, Everyone needs some basic tools in order to innovate. A hundred years ago, that could have been pen and paper. Today, it's the right technological tools, whether that be design tools, ideation tools, whiteboarding tools. And, and again, I would encourage companies to buy these tools for their employees, or conversely, there's free versions of a lot of tools. For example, our software is completely free for small organizations or small teams. So they should download so or access software like ours um, because it's available out there now for, you know, not just ours, but a lot of uh, competitor software is out there for free now. All right. Thank you, Nick, uh, for sharing that all with my audience. So I want to also talk about uh, the idea meritocracy. Uh, so why must the best idea always win? Is every idea a great idea, especially talking in terms of uh, driving innovation and success? Sure. So you asked a lot of questions there, but I'll try to break them down. Firstly, you said, is every idea a great idea? No, not all ideas are great ideas, but it is important for there to be bad ideas because amongst many bad ideas, good ideas happen. So that's a natural thing, a part of innovation or creativity that you are going to come up with a lot of ideas and ex ante or before the fact, you don't know which idea is going to be good. You have to try a lot of, I have a lot of ideas do a lot of experiments, and then you come out with the amazing ideas. Um, so not all ideas are good, but all ideas are worth ideating or brainstorming initially. Then the, the other half of your question was, um, why is an idea meritocracy important? So look, if you look at the typical organization, which ideas get done? It's the ones that come from the most senior person, right? It's what the CEO says or what the managing director says or somebody who's very important or speaks very loudly. But that person, no matter how smart they are, isn't always going to have the best ideas or the best uh, theories or the best processes. Um, in well-run organizations, good ideas get done regardless of where they come from. And that's what an idea meritocracy is, that the best idea wins, no matter whether it comes from the CEO or the janitor, whether it comes from someone in China or France or South Africa or the United States or England, doesn't matter, the best idea wins. And that's good for uh, the health of the organization. If you actually, there's a ton of research on this, that companies that have idea meritocracies rather than hierarchical uh, based decision structures tend to do better in, uh, both in the short and the long run. Uh, now we'll talk about innovative ideas. Uh, let's get personal here. Uh, I know you also uh, focus on personal development and self-improvement uh, as one of your topics. Uh, how can we uh, learn some valuable skills uh, totally for free? Do you have any idea that can help my audience along the yes. pursuit for personal development? So that's something I so firmly believe in. And the easiest way uh, to get, get develop new skills totally for free is there are free online universities that let you go learn topics from experts. So for example, last month I took a course from Princeton on algorithms that was taught by Princeton professors totally for free. And I used Coursera, uh, which is a free online university. You can you can either pay $100 to, for the certificate of the course, or you can just take all the knowledge of the course and pay zero. And I took the, I did the latter. I didn't pay any, I didn't need the certificate. So I just learned all the content taught by amazing Princeton professors. But that's one avenue. But there's a lot of other avenues. On YouTube, there's a whole bunch of educational channels that'll teach you anything from painting to finance to algorithms, whatever you want to learn in, in life. Now the internet gives it to you for free. And the cool thing is it's not, it's taught by world-class experts who are doing it for free and you don't have to pay anything for this stuff anymore. I personally spend between 30 to 40 hours every single month learning new skills. And I strongly encourage everyone else to, because we're in such a unique period in history where you get world-class experts available totally for free, which was not possible, you know, even as, as, as recently as 10 years ago. Absolutely. Thank you, Nick. And do you have any exciting news? So perhaps you have a project you think is going to be beneficial to the audience. Uh, you can share that at this time. Sure. I'll, I'll share two things. Number one, uh, idea scale software is completely for, is completely free for teams or organizations less than 100 people. So if you go to ideascale.com, you can set up my software, no downloads required, entirely on the cloud. 
in 30 seconds. Um, and it's totally for free for small teams or organizations. So highly encourage people to do that because that's a world-class software that, you know, big major company, billion dollar companies use. Um, number two is uh, from a company point of view, we're also really excited that in about two or three months, we are releasing some major new modules. The most exciting of which is an AI module that takes all your idea data and helps you automatically figure out which ideas are good versus which ideas are bad, which is a huge step forward because now human beings can rely on AI co-pilots to sort through all the bad ideas and identify the good ones. Absolutely. Wish you best of luck in that. Uh, in those projects, uh, Nick, uh, do you have any part of what you'd like to share? Also, uh, your social media handles on your website. Sure. So um, our, our company website is ideascale.com. And uh, we also have uh, a big LinkedIn account. For me personally, the best way to reach me is via LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Nick Jane. It's the bottom of the screen. Um, and would love to hear from folks. All right. Good to know. Thank you once again, uh, Nick Jane. You're the CEO of Ideascale and also the leading expert on how to make innovation happen. Thanks for joining me on the show and sharing your thoughts, especially your expertise on these important topics, how uh, we can build innovation culture. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. I wish you best of luck in all the projects you embark upon. Thank you once again. Thank you, Mabua. All right. If you'd like to catch up with any missed episodes of the show, you can do so on any cross-promotion platforms or any podcast description platforms you bump into online. And do have a great time. i talk to you soon. Thank you, Nate, once again. Bye. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you subscribe and leave us a review.